Thanks for coming, everyone. This is the Swift 101 intro in architecture for beginners. So if you want to know what Swift is, how it works, maybe even how it might look in a real production deployment, who's using it today, and all that kind of stuff, you're in the right place. Go oh, back one. Go back one. My name is John Dickinson. I'm the project technical lead for OpenStack Swift, and I've been involved in the project since it began. And I work at a company called SwiftStack. I'm the director of technology there. And with me today is the CEO of SwiftStack. Hi, I'm Joe Arnold, uh, CEO of SwiftStack. Uh, John and I met because we started working on some of the early, well, John was on the original project team for Swift at Rackspace, and I got a chance to work with him on some of the early deployments right after uh, Swift was open sourced. And so what we did was we formed a company around building, making Swift great, at the same time uh, building a product around uh, making people making it easy to deploy, scale, uh, and manage a, a Swift environment. And what Swift is, if you're not familiar, is- That's why we're here. <laughs> it's why we're here. It's an object storage system. So if you're familiar with Amazon S3 or Rackspace Cloud Files, which is Swift, that is what, uh, that's what, that's what the system is, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So one of the really thing, exciting things, uh, or things I'm excited about this week is how much there is about Swift all week long. And these are some of the sessions that are after this one. So not even counting some of the things that went on yesterday, uh, we've got at least nine more sessions sometime during the week on Swift itself. And a couple of interesting things here is if you are somebody who's interested in hearing what other people are doing in production with Swift, we've got some case studies that are coming up for real production users. If you are interested in the development side and say, I need to extend Swift and add some, some of my own functionality, we've got some things on there like the middleware stuff. And one of the ones I really wanted to point out is on Thursday, we've got a workshop on deploying OpenStack Swift, just a, a short little session. You can show up there and, uh, well, this one's a different one. Um, and, and, you can, and you can do that. But we also have a full day workshop on Thursday, a little bit off-site of the summit, but very close at the Ellis Hotel. It's a map here, and you can go to swiftworkshops.eventbrite.com and do that. That's gonna be a really, really deep dive, full day long into uh, building OpenStack Swift and getting it running on your own and really playing with it, you know, playing with failure conditions, talking about network diagrams, all of that kind of stuff. So if you're really interested in doing, uh, in learning, uh, really deep information uh, technically about really product, uh, putting it in production, I would really suggest you go to this. And finally, we've got a book. So we've got an O'Reilly book that is uh, OpenStack Storage with Swift, and it is available today. And every day at the SwiftStack booth, just right out here, uh, we will be giving away 100 copies, and you can pick up yours for free if you show up if you're the first 100 people to show up. Otherwise, uh, go to swiftstack.com slash book and you can uh, get the link to order it online. And we have, we're doing more, there's book signings today at 2.45 and then tomorrow at 3.30. If you wanna swing by the booth, well, there's gonna be an extra batch that we're gonna reserve for that. So let's get started. Why are we here? So, when, 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 I was, when Amazon first came out, I was happened to be at a place where uh, we were doing Ruby on Rails and deploying Ruby applications. And we built this platform service on top of Amazon. And it completely changed the game because now people could build applications, they can deploy it, they had APIs as a service, you could, you could get inf inf infrastructure via an API. And it really changed the games. It changed the games for the economics and it enabled developments and organizations to have a, a lot of agility. And then specific to storage, what happened was um, the, the, the object storage services that came out as part of the cloud, cloud infrastructure meant that you could have lots of applications all attaching themselves to the same pool of storage. And you had this multi-tenant storage platform rather than having an application with a dedicated storage environment. And, and, and that's, what, that's what cloud storage enabled. That's what first S3 enabled. And now that technology is available for people who wanted to have private in, uh, environments of their own object storage system. And the reality of the world is that as applications have changed, we have seen a massive, massive increase in the amount of data that people actually need to store. And unstructured data is what is dominating that increase in storage itself. So what is unstructured data? 
basically you think of it as just the common everyday stuff you normally use, like documents, photos, images, web content. If you've got applications that people are using on their cell phones and taking pictures, user generated content, um, playing online games, that sort of thing, where you've got a little piece of information you need to store, sometimes a large piece of information you need to store, um, that sort of data is just exploding as far as the amount of data we've got to store. And so the crux of the problem is that you can't avoid solving this problem. You've got to have something that's going to be able to store your data and also scale. And so when you do that, you've got a couple of choices. Um, but the reality, you have to have something that is on more than one computer someplace. You have to have a distributed system. So when you're solving distributed problems, you've got a choice to make. You can do one of two things. You know you always, if you've got computers talking to one another, you know you always have to be able to handle some degree of failures. You've got to be able to hack, uh, handle what happens if, for example, a network connection dies or something times out. But the, answer, the question is, what do you do when that happens? Do you go for something that's a really strong, consistent view, like I know exactly what's going to happen, um, and I know uh, the, the entire system has the exact same view of the data at all times? Or do you say, you know, I'm gonna relax that a little bit and I don't have to have the, uh, the answer right now, but I know I'm gonna get it, but I can go ahead and always respond to requests. So this is summed up in something called the CAP theorem, the CAP uh, that you see there. And what it says is that in a distributed system, you have to make a choice. You have to choose two of these things and you can't sacrifice the partition tolerance. What this means is that you have to make a choice between an eventually consistent system and a strongly consistent system. And both of these systems have extremely good use cases. One is not better than the other. So for example, it's incredibly important that in a block storage system, you have something that is strongly consistent. You don't want, for example, the underlying storage underneath your boot volume or that's underlying your database to suddenly change because something came back online later on. But that's not the case with this massive set of unstructured data that we see. It doesn't really matter that, um, that your mom's picture that she uploaded to Facebook is actually the same thing as your cousin's picture that he uploaded to Facebook. It doesn't matter that the strict ordering of those um, is always enforced. So you can have something that's eventually consistent. And this allows you to have a very highly available system. It's always gonna be able to respond to your, requ uh, your requests. And you're gonna have something that's gonna be very, very uh, able and easy to scale. And so that leads us to the question of, well, why Swift? Swift is an eventually consistent distributed storage system. And what this gives you is something that is able to scale globally. You can have one cluster with uh, locations all over the world. It allows you to have simple API access for applications, so it's easy to consume, and application developers can actually offload the hard problems of storage to the storage system itself. We've got a great story around this and I'm gonna talk about it in just a little bit. And from the IT side, what's really cool is that they can now get away from those silos that Joe was talking about and start working on pools of storage, which gives them both the cost savings of being able to share, share storage across the organization, but it also means that you can, uh, they, can, they can respond in a very agile way. They don't have to spend a lot of time provisioning and carving out pools of storage for a particular application and then worrying about how to scale that. Instead, they can just treat it as a service. IT can manage a service, developers can consume a service. And the final most important thing that I think is incredibly important, and it's why we're here this week at the OpenStack Summit, is that it gives you an ownership of your data. Everybody has data and you need to have ownership of everything that touches that, all the way from the hardware to the software that's doing it and the tool chains, uh, the, the, the actual tool chain that's uh, accessing the data. And the only way you can do that is something that's an open system. And that's one of the things I think that is really important about OpenStack and something that Jonathan Bryce was uh, really mentioned and hit home at, uh, in Hong Kong last fall, saying that the key part about OpenStack is the open. We've got an open system that people can participate in and actually influence the direction, and that's what gives you ownership of the things that touch your data. So who's using Swift? There's a, there's a lot of people using Swift. And what's really unique about Swift as a storage project is that the people who are working on it, the people who are contributing to it, mirrors what's happening in the rest of the OpenStack. So what that means is there's lots of companies that have built businesses, that are providing services, that are contributing and are part of the Swift community and contributing Swift code. And so it means that when, when functionality is being developed, it's being developed by 
multiple people, multiple companies, all contributing towards that effort. Um, as a result, I think it adds a lot of comfort for people who to pick Swift as a technology because they know that there's going to be a broad ecosystem to support them. So let's talk about real-world use cases. You've seen other people, but how does it fit you, and how does that actually map? There's one use case I want to talk about here first that's uh, Pac-12. You may know them as you know, that sports uh, group, collegiate sports group. Um, if you're like me, it's go sports. But what's really kind of cool about this is their use case is that they've got literally hundreds of video streams that they've got to do. They're basically a TV station. And they've got to record a bunch and broadcast a bunch of uh, sporting events every year, something on the order of like 800 a year or something like that. So their story was that they had a, an existing SAN that they were putting all of their data in, which is great. You know, say, hey, you know, I've got a lot of video. I need to throw it in my SAN. It's going to be great. Well, they started running out of room on their SAN, as one does. And what do you do? Well, they archived some of that. They put it on tape, and they put it on a shelf. Great. Well, they're still running out of space, and it's getting kind of expensive, so what do you do? Well, they built a Swift cluster, and they were able to migrate all of their data that was in their SAN to their Swift cluster, which is really great because it allowed them to really lower costs. But the really interesting thing, and the, the, the thing that's really exciting to me about it is that it's not just cost savings. They were, because they were putting their video content into a highly available system, it actually enables the opportunity for new revenue models for them. So because Swift is able to run on commodity hardware uh, and just you know, cheap white boxes someplace, it means that the marginal cost of them taking their archive tape video footage and putting it into their highly available Swift cluster is less than the potential revenue they have of actually doing that. So the really cool idea is thinking, you know what, I want to go see that 1994 football game. Well, now if somebody's doing that, they don't have to think about, well, what tape is that on and how do I do that? You can't monetize that. But they can actually say now with a highly available system, look, we can do this and we can charge somebody $5 to go watch that or something like this. So I'm really excited to, to watch them and see how they're going to be able to take advantage of this new sort of uh, highly available system. And we have two more, two more use cases uh, right after this one on the third floor. Uh, Fred Hutchinson is going to be presenting a use case where they're doing HPC and providing an economy file store. So you can hear the nitty gritty of how they implemented it. Georgia Tech tomorrow at, I believe, 10, 10 o'clock. Sorry, the time is on the beginning one. Um, and we're going to talk about their use case as well. So there's two more use cases that are in the program at the show that you can go watch. And one thing, the last one I want to talk about, this is something I heard about once I got here to Atlanta. This is really kind of cool. So there's a site out there called adrift.org.au, and it's a really kind of fun site. You click on any place in the ocean, and it shows you what the dispersal pattern for ocean debris is over the next 10 years. It's a great scientific thing and really important for understanding how our world works. But you may have heard that there was an airline that went, an airplane that went missing, and it was apparently a big news story. And they were looking in the middle of the Indian Ocean and figuring out, well, if this crashed, where would the debris be? It turns out that the Guardian uh, found this website and promptly swamped their servers because, you know, slash dot effect, essentially. And so they were looking at it and saying, well, what, what can we do here? Well, we can scale out our Nginx servers. We know how to do that. That's a, that's a, known, a known thing. But, you know, it's adds operational complexity and things like that. And they realized the data we have on this is already being stored in Swift. What if we just threw that data directly to the browser? What if we let the browsers directly connect to our Swift cluster? And that's what they did. Boom, problem solved. They did not have to worry about scaling out their web applications because it was this, the, the available storage system that was offloading those hard problems of high concurrency to, uh, away from that storage application. This is something I was really excited about. I want to talk more to these guys. Uh, it was just really kind of cool to find this week. So let's talk about some hardware. So you want to actually put this in production. What does it look like? There's one thing um, that I'm working on right now is building out this uh, a community test cluster. And this is a really cool uh, set of hardware. It was uh, uh, donated by uh, Intel and HGST. Um, we've got some of the new helium, uh, uh, the helium drives, uh, six terabyte drives, uh, in 12 of those in one U on these, uh, these, uh, these servers here. And it is uh, it's just kind of off-the-shelf things. These are using Intel's new Aviton processors, um, really low power, really high connectivity. They've got you know, the 12 SATA ports on it and two 10-gig ports and four 1-gig ports, and it's all in a 400-watt power supply. It's really exciting stuff. So we're building this out for the, uh, for the community right now. Um, but if you're wanting to do something else, um, there's other kind of uh, things you can have as well. 
uh, for example, you can look at just the kind of generic for you chassis uh, that gives you a lot of, uh, a lot of storage within a, a good form factor uh, using basically standard off the shelf hardware. And you can buy this kind of product from uh, lots of different companies out there. This is something I believe was uh, from uh, Fred Hutchison. Yeah, and, and, and there's also, there's, there's many other vendors that all have configurations that um, are available that you can buy off the shelf from all the major vendors that are ready to go to run Swift and can be bundled and, and sold right on those. So uh, depending on which manufacturer you're comfortable with going, there's many options. And then later today, there's gonna be another session just talking about hardware selection in Swift. So once, you all ha once you've bought your hardware, you need to figure out how do we actually put this together? What, do we, what, is, what does it look like in real life? I mean, like, I can conceptualize this, but show me what it looks like. Well, here's an example. Let's say you're starting out with kind of a moderate-sized Swift cluster, a you know, half a dozen boxes and a couple of racks. Um, in this case, let's go from the top down. What you've got up at the front, you need to have some sort of load balancer uh, solution. You can use something that's open source, like HAProxy. You can buy something that's... Um, uh, from a vendor out there, depending on what your needs are. Um, then you've got your normal aggre uh, aggregation switching uh, that you're doing, and each, each rack is going to have their normal top of rack switch. In this example, we've got a couple of proxy servers. Uh, I'll go into detail on what these pieces uh, mean in just a little bit. But we've got a couple of, basically you can think of the front end servers in one rack, and then we've got our storage capacity in another. So what, um, and what this allows you to do is really optimize what it is that you need. Do you need more uh, network connectivity and client uh, throughput? Well, let's add some more proxy servers. Do you need some more capacity? You can scale that independently and just plug in more servers with hardware. So what happens when you uh, run out of space on this? Well, let's add another rack and add a little bit more of uh, capacity. And even if you want to go beyond that, you don't have to just add new racks all the time. You can even just backfill your existing capacity. And Swift is gonna be able to automatically take care of this for you. And that's what we're gonna get into next. How does, that, how does Swift actually work? Let's go over some of the, the architecture levels of how it's put together and what's going on. So I mentioned earlier that Swift is, has a pretty simple API. It's a REST-based API. And all that means is that it uses standard HTTP ver verbs and response codes. It speaks the normal language of the internet. This is what a URL looks like that's referring to something inside of Swift. The big parts here I want to pay attention to are the account, the container, and the object. An account is basically your, your playground, your, your place to put stuff. Um, it could be, say, your, your organizational's business unit place to put stuff. Point is, when you get an account on a Swift cluster, now you can create containers inside of it. And an account keeps a list of what containers you have and a little bit of metadata. The container, similarly, keeps a list of what are the objects you have in this particular container. So given an account on your system, you may uh, create a container to call images, and then you're going to upload cat.jpg, because the internet's for cat pictures. And that's going to be your object name. So what does this look like? You actually want to create it. You do a put request, and you're going to get back a 200 response, or a 201 created. Uh, when you do a read object, you do a git. What this means, and as demonstrated by the Adrift, the, uh, the Adrift site, is that you can, this, this normal browsers, you can just talk to this, and it's very easy and very easy to integrate into existing uh, languages, SDKs, uh, tool chains, applications, all of that stuff. So here's, here's the parts of Swift. This is, this is it. It's a very simple design, very modular, allows you to do um, a, a lot of really cool stuff. So first, we've got a client. The client talks to the proxy server. The proxy server is responsible for implementing most of the API and making sure that the communication with the storage nodes is handled appropriately. The storage nodes are responsible for actually persisting stuff to a disk. So if you remember that diagram from earlier, we had some proxy servers in one rack, and we had the account container and object server storage nodes on some servers in another rack. Let me ask you a question here. Does the client ever talk to a hard drive? No. Does the, uh, does the client ever have to worry about, say, a particular object server failing? No. So what really is great here is that you've got the proxy server, which is abstract, can be publicly exposed and is abstracting away the, the complexities of what's the state of your distributed uh, system and you know, hardware failures and timeouts and network load and things like that and completely making that uh, transparent to the application. And more importantly, um, the application never has to think about, well, 
what directory did I put this in, or what hard drive is this stored on? And do I have to figure out how to do this distributed lock in some POSIX file system in order to coordinate it across all my million mobile phone applications and things like that? You just can't do that with these sort of systems, and that's what Swift is doing. It's abstracting away these hard drives so that it makes uh, the failure handling automatic and transparent to the user, and the, and the user, the application there, simply consumes it as a service. So what this design gives you is something that's highly scalable. You can add, it's linearly scalable because there's no single point of failure. You keep adding more and more and more and the system continues to uh, perform and improve and get better. And it's, in that way, it's just a, it's a fully distributed system. So we need to figure out what does that give us? Swift is optimized for massive concurrency across the entire, entire data set, which means that if you've got um, you know, really hot content, you may need to put some caching in front of that. But if you've got content that's kind of that traditional long tail power curve uh, looking uh, access pattern, Swift is absolutely amazing at that, that sort of thing. So how do we figure out ultimately where to put it on the hard drives? We've got to take some object, your, your image, your video, your, your document, and we've got to put it on a hard drive someplace just to actually make sure we can store it. So to do that, we use something called consistent hashing. Consistent hashing is, um, is a pretty cool thing because it allows us to easily scale out our capacity. But let's talk about, well, what is, what is hashing? And we're all familiar with this because we all grew up going to an encyclopedia and looking something up. So if you had to do a book report and you wanted to learn about birds, what volume in the encyclopedia do you pull out? B, because that's where it hashes to. You just kind of look at that prefix and you know what it was. But if you're gonna go do something on octopuses, octopi, then you're gonna go to O, and if you're gonna go look at something in the zoo, you go to Z's. So that's a very easy understanding of, I know exactly how hashing works. Okay, I'm gonna go here, it's a, it's a shortcut to figure out how to put my stuff into a particular bucket. Well, consistent hashing is similar to that. What it does is it uses a hash algorithm to splay things around what we call a ring. And it's conceptually a ring because when you get to the end and you add one, it just goes back to the beginning, which gives us a ring. So what happens is, for example, you take a hash of a particular thing to figure out where it goes. It goes to a point on that ring, and then it starts, for example, let's, let's go clockwise and find the next node that's been entered into the ring. Now that has responsibility um, for that particular data. Well, this is a really good system. This is something that is uh, proven at very large scale. But there's some few things that we can do to improve this, this sort of scheme. Instead of putting things essentially randomly around the around this consistent hashing ring, what we can do is we can evenly divide our space and assign things to even partitions. And what this gives us is a very nice uh, even filling of all of our hard drives. So in Swift, what happens is we hash this stuff up, we take the prefix of that hash, just like the first few letters of an encyclopedia article, and we can directly look this up um, in our ring, which means that essentially we figure out cat.jpg, that's gonna hash to, for example, hard drive number 728, and then have your hard drive number 720, or partition, let's say 728. Partition 728 we know is gonna be on three hard drives, one, seven, and nine, and that's our three replicas of our system. So we store three replicas of the, of the data in, in Swift to ensure that you have high durability and failover when hardware fails. This is how we choose what hard drive it goes on. We've kinda got a, a, a tiering system. At the very bottom, you've got hard drives. These are your ultimate failure domain. They fail pretty often, about 5% a year on average, and you need to be able to account for that. So we're gonna, put it on, we're gonna put it on multiple hard drives. But if we have more than one server, we also wanna protect against server failure so that you can not only handle that failure but also do in-place upgrades without ever having to worry about taking your whole cluster down. So in this case, if we have more than one server, we wanna make sure we have it assigned to drives that are on different servers. And then we can even group servers into what we call availability zones. Most often time in deployments, this is mapped to a rack because a rack, a rack has either a single power supply or a, or a single top of rack switch. That's a physical failure domain that you wanna protect against. And finally, you can group racks oftentimes into a data center or a region, places that are geographically distant and don't really necessarily have good network connectivity between them, or maybe it's just expensive. So when we choose something, we choose it as uniquely as possible. So in this case, we've chosen three hard drives, and you can see it's splayed across um, both. It's, we've got one region, but we've got two zones, and we've got three servers that have responsibility of this. And in this case, we can go up to the level of losing an entire rack 
and not have to worry about unavailability or loss of data. So the way we do that is by, like I said, storing more than one copy in the system. And generally, three is a good balance, although you can separate this, you can change this uh, on the fly in Swift, but the whole cluster has the same replication factor. Normally, it's three. It's a good balance of durability, availability, and cost. We also consistently, uh, continually check the, uh, check the data with checksums. So when something is stored, we take a hash of that and uh, check some of the entire data and make sure that that is um, the same, it still has the same checksum sometime later. This protects us against, say, powering the, or losing power to a hard drive in the middle of a write. You don't wanna have that file system corruption um, causing problems. And then we, we do that by automatically scrubbing the data, walking the data in the background to, uh, to make sure that it's still the right data. And then the replication process that is running on Swift is making sure that when something is, becomes unavailable, it will automatically uh, copy and, uh, another, another replica will be pushed to the appropriate location, which means that as, an, as a sysadmin, if, you get, if you're on call this weekend and a hard drive goes down and your pager goes off, what do you do? Well, it's 3 a.m. on Saturday or Sunday morning. Go back to sleep. Take care of it on Monday. Swift is already going to take care of it for you. So we're obviously an OpenStack project. So how do we fit in with the rest of OpenStack? The important thing here uh, that I want to talk about is that we are a, a piece of that entire system. It's not something that's a replacement for your VMs or something that you're going to plug in directly to uh, yeah, as your boot device, but it's something that participates and provides a solution for scaling and matching your infrastructure directly to your application's use cases. So just as you need to have scalable and dynamically uh, configurable compute instances and be able to attach networks and, and block devices to those, you also need to be able to have access to a storage system for your application that can dynamically treat that storage as a service. So within the other OpenStack pro projects, absolutely working with things like Keystone and Solometer and Glance and, and Cinder and um, all of those other projects so that the entire system works better together. Now, one thing I want to point out, and it is uh, it's a little bit uh, of, uh, interesting within OpenStack, is that um, Swift, because it is not intimately tied to those computing pieces, can be deployed separately from, say, Nova and Cinder. Uh, but it certainly works very well with them. So where do we fit in? How does that work? Um, what do we provide beyond this? Swift is an open source object storage system, and that is what SwiftStack is providing here, but we're also adding on some of that, um, the, the monitoring, the management, the, uh, the needs that you have to integrate that into your IT infrastructure. So we've got Swift at the core there, and you put that on your own hardware, and then we added in a little bit of a, some, some monitoring to let you know what's going on right now. And then you now have an out-of-band management controller. Not that we're gonna see your data, but just that you can know what's happening to my cluster right now. And then once I know what's happening to my cluster and when something goes wrong, you can say, how do I respond to that? How do I fix that? How do I integrate this into my monitoring systems that's IT-wide? How do I integrate this into my auth systems? How do I integrate this into my capacity management pl planning and doing chargebacks and, and that sort of thing? Those are the, piece, the pieces and the tools that uh, SwiftStack is providing alongside of Swift. So I wanna be clear here, um, when SwiftStack is contributing to Swift, what we're doing is we're pushing all of that storage engine code upstream and that our product is out of band and not, we're not hosting your data or anything like that. So where do we go for more info, Joe? Well, so there's the SwiftStack. We have a, a website that goes over the architecture. You can check that out at swiftstack.com slash, open, slash OpenStack hyphen Swift. There's API docs. So if you don't get a chance to get a book, which has about three chapters dedicated on how to build applications with the Swift API, how to build middleware with the Swift API. There's also API docs that are online. And then for contributors, there's an IRC channel, which is pretty active. And uh, if you want to get the book, come to, uh, come to the booth or find it, go to the, the URL, swissstack.com forward slash book, and uh, we can get you a copy. Yeah. Now we've got about 10 minutes left for questions, and I think we've got a couple of mics here. Um, and I will definitely repeat the question so we can hear it on the video and 
make sure that everybody hears it. I think there was the first question over here. That's a great question. So the question was about multiple proxy servers in front of one Swift cluster so that you can have multiple geographies and things like that. And the answer is absolutely, of course. Um, the proxy server, that, that's exactly the way it's built. Doesn't matter if you're in one location, you're gonna wanna have more than one proxy server anyway just for HA, probably behind some sort of load balancer. But in the case of a geographic cluster, for example, let's say you have one Swift cluster and you have a location in Amsterdam, one in Hong Kong, and one in Dallas. You certainly don't want all of your European customers to end up going to Hong Kong for their routing. So you may put something like that. It's external to Swift, but uh, build up some sort of uh, anycast GeoDNS sort of system. And then you can route that to the appropriate region, and then Swift is going to be able to uh, take that Swift. What, by, by Swift is going to be able to take that, I mean the Swift proxy server will receive the request and know how to store that on um, the particular, um, in the right place within the cluster. Now I want to go into a little more detail on that because the global clusters are pretty exciting. And uh, Joe gave a great talk on it yesterday, and you should uh, definitely look for that video. The, uh, the thing about global clusters is we've got a couple of different ways to scale that out. One is to say that I'm going to optimize for local access, and so I can, I can read and write directly from that location and say that I'm going to write all of my uh, copies immediately in this one location, and then we're going to asynchronously replicate them across. And we can uh, do that on the reads, too. Choose a copy that's local. And then the other way you can do that is you can say that um, I'm just going to make sure that when that write request comes into Amsterdam, it's going to be real-time pushed across. Therefore, we know it's going to be available in all of the locations immediately. Question here? Yeah, uh, uh, this is probably elementary. I'm trying to learn. But how would you characterize yourself versus no SQL databases? I mean, to me, it seems like there's some cro crossover. They're, I'm sure they're not identical. Sure. but. That's a great question. So I think the, the pithy answer there is, you know, when it comes down to it, everything's a key value store, right? <laughs> um, but, the, you know, comparison to those sort of things, um, a lot of times those sorts, uh, NoSQL databases, are designed for a couple of different things. One, they're designed for storing very small values uh, because you want to store just, you know, a few bytes or maybe even, you know, a couple of K or something like that. And number two, you're probably going to try to do a lot of relations between the data. So you, even if it's some sort of MapReduce thing, you want to be able to dynamically compute across that. Swift is not designed for those sort of things. Swift is designed to be able to store um, up to and beyond multiple gig gigabyte files. Works OK for small files as well, but you want to be able to have this more um, just kind of generic storage pool that it does. And it's responsible for storing the data, not doing the compute on that. Now, an interesting thing, and there's a talk later this week on it, is there's a project uh, called Zero VM, which is exactly designed to allow you to run your own compute jobs on the Swift cluster itself right next to your data. So it's something I'm really interested in continuing to look at. Um, it's something that's going on inside of Rackspace right now. Um, so definitely keep your eyes open for that sort of thing. Uh, but in general, the answer uh, that I have is it's designed for more um, uh, a larger data that's going to be uh, heavy on the uh, just the kind of static content that can grow without bound, rather than the things that are more dynamically changing and need relations all the time. Wait, so, if I understood what you said, is another way to put that is Swift is more dealing with almost opaque blobs. Exactly. Instead exactly. of like data you can analyze. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Over here. Okay, thank you. How does latency and throughput of Swift uh, like varies with under uh, like underlying storages? So uh, latency and storage on the network connections between inside of the cluster? So between the client and the Swift and client with the real storage underlying, how does the latency actually changes due to Swift? So Swift has d been demonstrated to, I mean, it powers some of the largest storage clouds in the world. So I mean, it's been demonstrated to be a very performant system for those highly available, use, high concurrency use cases. Uh, normally, the first scaling points you're going to have in a Swift system, well, actually, the, normally the first scaling points are the, the latency or the, the, the bandwidth available between the client and the Swift cluster itself. Normally, that's the constraining factor. But inside of the cluster, um, oftentimes, the things that get saturated is, yes, the network latency there. So most of the time, people are deploying on 10 gigabit networks um, because it's, these days it's pretty cheap to get that and just deploy that everywhere um, compared to what the performance you get. 
Um, and uh, there's also quite a few uh, you know, buffer sizes and kernel tuning parameters you can do. Um, overall, Swift is not designed for single stream throughput. It's designed for massive concurrency across the entire data set. And I think that's the optimization factor we have there. You had what? one in the front here? How do you stay consistent in the case of concurrent updates? Well, we don't. So, well, and we kind of do. So the point, it's eventually consistent. So the way we do our uh, conflict resolution, if two people are uploading the exact same named object, but different versions of it, or different copies of it, different data, um, it's, it's a last right wins. And so even in the split brain scenario, if you have, it's uploaded here and it's uploaded here, then the one that's gonna be, uh, that was uploaded last is the one that's gonna take precedence when that split brain is restored. John, now, wh why don't we do, uh, why don't we do one more? For large objects, uh, does the latency has, uh, like, uh, in, uh, does Swift has latency impacts due to the uh, fact that, uh, like, replication is going to take place? For large objects, due to replication or, uh, like, uh, So, uploading the, the, the large objects and saying that the the, the effort of putting them into the multiple locations is causing you serious latency. Is that the understanding my, well, the question? Yes, yes, that's right. With large objects, you're less latency sensitive because you're streaming a large object up to the okay. system. And right? the important point is streaming there. So we're not taking it and then copying it and then uh, copying it to the locations and then giving you a response. Mm -hmm. You send, a, of, of your five gigabyte object, you send us 64K, we stream out 64K. We're not spooling, we're not doing anything like that. So it, it's very, it's very, um, it's going to be, it's determined by what is the latency of your network in your cluster. That's, that's what it is. Why don't, why don't we do one more question for the gentleman who's been waiting, and then anyone else, we can come up and we can have a discussion on the side. Um, in the Amazon space, there, there's products that actually translate from file system protocols to S3. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is that a bad idea? And is there anything, is there a counterpart product in the Swift space? Yeah, so the, so if you're putting, so, to answer the, the latter question first, can you put a file system on top of an object storage? The answer is yes, but it means that you're not going to be able to provide a truly POSIX file system with locking. And there's pros and cons of that. Um, we off, Swiss offers a file system gateway for our customers to help them bridge the gap. They want to be in objects, but they also want to have one foot in a file system. So we present SIFs and NFS, but you're still not allowed to lock objects. And then for, and so if you take a file system and then put objects on top of that, you're, you're doing something very similar. You're, you're not getting the same scale out properties like we just, and all the benefits and the concurrency as, uh, as, you, as you would out of a native object storage um, by, by putting a gateway that speaks objects on top of it. At least that's our view. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So I think we, yeah, we, uh, Feel free to come up and have questions. Um, I'm not my name on Twitter. Uh, Joe is Joe Arnold at Twitter, and uh, we'd be happy to ask, answer yeah, any questions please. you may have. <laughs>